um, this was an opportunity for me to renew who did I want to be now that I was no longer a wife, no longer the mother of a two parent family, no longer the two income earning family. And I this is my choice to rebuild my life. And I can do that in a way that's positive and productive and beautiful, or I can allow grief to become my identity and be miserable. This is episode number 507 with Susan Ways, Dating as a Widow. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Weiner, and welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And if you would like support on your journey to lasting love, and even if you're married or in a relationship, I wrote a book that will help all of you because it's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. It's filled with 30 tips and stories and exercises, all designed to help you be more confident from your core so that you live a life of value where you are valued and you value yourself. And you can find it on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. If you're watching this on YouTube, here's what it looks like. And uh, every week I bring you a tip from the book. This week's tip is step number eight, be more vulnerable. Vulnerability got a bad rap for a long time. And Brene Brown, if you haven't heard of her, you've been living under a rock, but Brene Brown became like the queen of vulnerability. And she really shined a light on why vulnerability is so important in our lives. And what she says is that it's, it's like the opposite of shame. When we can be more vulnerable, we can show all sides of us, we can share our feelings with each other, we can create more depth and more intimacy. And so if you are in any kind of relationship where you're not really telling the truth and showing you, yourself authentically to that person, maybe you're avoiding a tough conversation, I encourage you this week to try to have that conversation, just, just do it. Because when you're not really authentic and speaking up and saying the truth, you don't have a true authentic relationship. And to me, that's that's all there is. That's what we're all aiming for. Before I bring Susan on, I wanna give a shout out to my Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date. And it is a fabulous group where we really just support you on your journey to love. It is extremely well monitored. I have seven monitors and we are really encouraging people to be kind, to be honest, to speak up, to do all the hard things on the path to lasting love. So if you're a woman over 40, join us there. And now for my guest, she's actually a returning guest, Susan Ways. She's a podcaster. I've been on her podcast as well twice, and this is her second second time here. She's a blogger. She's an inspirational speaker and a human resource professional. After she lost her husband to lung cancer in 2017, she embarked on a grief journey and that inspired her to create her podcast called Tendrils of Grief. It's a fabulous podcast. Go check it out. And her goal is to create a space of shared stories that are relatable and connect grievers together in the spirit of healing, understanding, and psychological safety. Welcome back to the show, Susan. Thank you. I am honored to be here again. So let's talk about dating as a widow. We, I, I've had many clients who are widows and their experience is a little bit different than somebody who's divorced or never married. So can you share some of the differences? Sure. I think the main difference that I, from my perspective is really, I don't have an ex-spouse that is in the picture. So people don't have to worry about that relationship so much, but I think that also becomes confusing to some of the men that I've dated has been my experience just because I get questions like, were you in love when he died? And they're not quite sure how to compartmentalize that. But I find that with the ex-spouse in the picture that you have to contend with somebody else being there and there's that relationship and they have to create space for my spouse who passed away because his memory is still very much alive and it's a loving, wonderful memory, but I have to create space for the physical presence of their ex-spouse that's in their life. And that may not be so loving 
And there could be some other energy around that. So that is one of the biggest differences that I've noticed is kind of balancing that relationship. Yeah, there's everybody comes with their past and their baggage and all kinds of things. And I have dated uh, widowers and it's it's different every time. I mean, each one is, has been very different. Some have been fully healed when they started dating me. Some have been really mourning the lost, grieving the loss and not ready to date yet, even though they thought they were. And even though there isn't that person, there have been other issues. Like um, I, I've had clients who've come into a home where there's still pictures hanging everywhere. And it's like, how do you, how do you address some of those things? So, you know, I don't know what your house looks like, but do you have a lot of pictures of your husband? I I do have pictures. Uh, his name was Paul. And I have a daughter that is his and my daughter together. And she's still in high school. And I didn't want to take that away from her because our family was taken away from her. And so the pictures are up and our wedding pictures are still up. But I've asked, I've only had two guys that have come to my house. One hasn't met her, but the other one did meet her. And I've asked them how they felt about that. And both of them were okay. If I was going to be moving in with somebody else, would I have the, those pictures up? Probably not. I would move them to her room or a space where she could view them if she wanted to. But for right now, I'm still in the house that we lived in together. I still feel like there's an element of family that I want her to be able to remember. And until I meet that special someone where we have a long-term future together, I, I think I, they're going to have to be okay with that. Yeah, I like that. That sounds really healthy. And you do have to consider your children. I, I even remember divorce-wise, when when I got divorced, I thought about moving again because I, I love new adventures. And then I realized that that would affect all of my children <laughs> and it's not just me. So yeah, I could have had a great adventure, but then I would have been abandoning my children or pulling them right. away from their father or just complicating their lives even further. And so, you know, it takes a lot to think about not only yourself, but how, how are your children going through all that? And how old was, how old was she when, when he Madison passed away? was 14 when he, when he passed away and she's 18 now, a senior in high school and still, I mean, his memory is very much alive and I can tell when she's grieving, she'll wear his clothes. That's mm -hmm. her way of feeling close to him as she, we I had her pull out a bunch of clothes that she liked and they're hanging in a closet and she'll go and get them and either sleep in them or wear them around. Wow. How does that feel to you when she does that? I, I just know that she's hurting particularly. I've learned enough to know and I'll ask her if she wants to talk about it, but I love that she has a way to soothe that grief if it's wearing his sweatshirt because teenagers don't always want to talk to you about how they're feeling. So mm -hmm. it's, I, I allow her that space. Sandy, I did want to say when you talked about the differences and talked about dating the widowers that you've dated, some of what you said resonated so deeply with me because some of the men that I've dated who have been divorced, I found that they're really not over their ex-spouse. And again, that person's physically in the picture and they've either been attached to the person, attached to the story around the breakup of their marriage, or they haven't done the work. They've wanted to be a victim of the breakup of the marriage and haven't done the work to say, yeah, this, maybe she cheated on me, but I did these things that I would do differently this time. And I need someone that's done the work, whether it's a widower or somebody that's divorced. That's so important to me. Amen, sister. <laughs> I think about that all the time. I think it doesn't really matter who you are, or where you come from. It really matters who you've become through the process of whatever it is that you've gone through in life. And if you're still in a victim mode and blaming or just stuck, it's really hard to be in a, you know, start a new relationship with people like that. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about you and how you knew you were ready to date again. Well, that was kind of what you were saying. I wasn't ready to date in the beginning and I dated 
way too quickly. And I even had a long distance overseas relationship where I took my very first international trip to be with someone for a week. It wasn't anything that was going to be long term, but I just needed a break from the grief, a break from my life, a break from all of the drama that had become the cancer and the subsequent grieving of me and my daughter. And I just wasn't ready. And I thought I was, to your point, because a lot of times we think we are. And people had lots of advice for me as to whether they thought I was ready or not, which I found humorous and annoying all at the same time. <laughs> but the, so I, I really started to date. And I shared with you on my podcast that I remember one time I, I went out on a date with this guy and I just sat across the table looking at him and he was talking. I couldn't even tell you what he was saying. And all I could think of was, God, I wish you were Paul. And he didn't have a fighting chance. I mean, he could have been the best man in the world. And I just wasn't ready for that. As time went on, and I did become more ready. And I was in a relationship with a man who was didn't do the work. He, his wife left him and left him for a woman after a series of affairs. But she, he just didn't do the work. And he was very attached to that victim and being the hero for his kids. And it was then that I was introduced to Amir Levine's book, Attached, and realized that he was emotionally avoidant. And where I'm typically a secure attacher, I went, he threw me right into an anxious attachment style and learned so much about that and about myself. And I took some time to heal from that. That was about seven months ago and realized so much. I learned so much. And now I'm in a space where I feel like I'm, I'm really just ready to share my life with someone, but it needs to be the right someone. Right. So yeah, thanks for sharing part of your journey. And I think a lot of people date before they're ready. I mean, I, I don't know too many people who are actually ready when they're ready, when they think they yeah. are, you know, you kind of have to jump in at some point because otherwise it's easy to just get used to a life that's you know, single and you're still missing, you're missing being in partnership. And so a lot of people who date widows or widowers are wondering, you know, are you going to be compared to the late spouse? Are they ever going to be able to fall in love again? Like what, what is up with, you know, the possibility of being in a relationship? So there's probably a lot of fear and I'm wondering from you, um, you know, what's it, what is it like this time around? Like, is it, is, you know, I'm imagining it's not, you're trying to replace Paul, right. but you know, tell us, tell us a little bit from your perspective, what, what dating is like and in, in comparison to what your loss was. Uh, sure. And, and I really love this topic because I'm not looking to replace Paul. And I never could replace Paul. And that wouldn't be fair to me. It wouldn't be fair to Paul. And it wouldn't be fair to the person coming in my life. I want to create something unique and beautiful that lives in its own space. That And have that separate because where Paul and I were, I want that to be able to remain in its own space. But there are opportunities for a reset. No relationship is perfect. My relationship with Paul was very good. We were great friends. But he didn't drink. And I really enjoy wine and wine tasting. And I want to go to Napa as one of my bucket trip items. And he didn't drink. So I, I couldn't share that with him. And there, he wasn't really into traveling. And I love to travel and I want to explore and do more of that. And I'm looking for somebody that I can create all of these things in this iteration of my life, because we change and we evolve. And when I met Paul, I was a different version of myself and we kind of grew together. But now at this version of myself, I probably wouldn't have picked him if I met him on a dating site today, <laughs> because our diff we're so different in our interests and where we are. And there's not co-parenting and building a house together and doing that kind of stuff. It's, it's more about focusing on you and that person and building a relationship off of those commonalities and shared interests at this stage in your life. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think people need to really take stock of that. You know, I think people who have had any kind of loss, that it's not about replacing somebody or something. It's about having, be, having fulfillment, you know, having your values met, having what you really want and need, but not trying to match 
exactly what you had because that's impossible and it would be the most frustrating yeah. thing and also not even what you want. That's that's absolutely true. And what you said in the opening of the show around vulnerability is so important because that's one thing dating now. I mean, I haven't dated for a really long time outside of the last couple of years and I don't know what to do. And it's, there's this fine invisible line between being too vulnerable and not vulnerable enough. And, and I have really struggled trying to master that skill of learning where that sweet spot is of letting somebody know that you're interested, but not being just because the loneliness when you're a widow is incredible because something was taken away from you that you loved yeah, and it wasn't your choice. So it's just really trying to not finding that person that comes in and you're like, Oh my gosh, you're here. Let me call you every day and text you a hundred times and, and really have allowing somebody to kind of lean into the natural cadence of a relationship. Yeah. Whatever that looks like. (laughs) And, you know, and you're reminding me of several clients I've had who have gone from um, a really unhealthy relationship to kind of, you know, I'm thinking of vulnerability, but really having like an emotional affair with somebody who actually pays attention, who they, who makes them feel seen and heard and valued. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to go from that deficit. And I think I would imagine that anybody who's been a caretaker for a long time and hasn't really had that back and forth, real healthy relationship at the end of life. You know, some people have a long sickness. Some people have a short, I know somebody whose husband was murdered. You know, it's all different. Um, People who were not sick at all, and then suddenly bam, they're gone and you have no preparation. So I have a neighbor whose husband was sick for about 14 years. And at the end stage of his life, he was in a wheelchair, couldn't speak, couldn't really move um, anything but his eyes. And he had full-time help. And I know that her life was extremely difficult, Yes. but I also know that this was her life and it gave her a sense of purpose and meaning to be there for him and to coordinate care. And, you know, grieving is complicated. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices, your smartphone, your tablet, your PC or Mac, Fire TV, and any Alexa-enabled devices like the Amazon Echo. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. Let's talk a little bit about the grief process because I've had clients who really were still grieving and it was, they kept comparing everyone they were meeting to their husband who, who they lost. Um, is there like, what did you do to grieve? And do you have any suggestions for people who are grieving? Sure. So going back a little bit to what you said about the emotional affair, that was really how I got involved with the person overseas, because it was just everything I wanted it to be. And I actually went to overseas to visit him twice. And it was that just that beautiful, wonderful, not reality of a relationship. And that was a part of how I actually processed through my grief. It was an avoidance part of it. And I think we all go through an avoidance, whether it's working too much or drinking or watching Netflix, whatever that is. And mine just happened to be the dating and having the emotional affair with this person that was just not sustainable. But the healthier side of my grief journey really involved a lot of talking to people. I did therapy. I listened to podcasts. I read books. I just really did the work. And I tell this story on my podcast that after about 15 months of being just down and out miserable and feeling like I was miserable to be around because I was angry and just felt so cheated by the universe, And I started a gratitude journal 
And that was the turning point for me. And I resentfully started the gratitude journal in the beginning. And I just from there really started to adopt this attitude of gratitude because once you let it in, it begins to come in a little bit more and a little bit more naturally. And I started my podcast through this journey and was able to talk to other people who we all feel like we're the only one in the world who feels this way and nobody understands our grief and nobody understands our love. And, but it's not the case. Everybody's different, but there's a a lot of shared, which is why I came up with the title tendrils of grief, because there's all these shared tendrils, whether you've lost a child or a parent or a spouse, a best friend, where you can sit and talk to somebody and say, oh gosh, yes, that happened to me. And you start to feel less broken because there's commonality in our, in our union of brokenness. So I think it was just really that. And I have, you said this when we talked before that I have a growth mindset. I'm always, I don't want to be stuck. I don't want to be that person. And so it was important to me to figure this out. And it also, Sandy, is an opportunity. Like we have the gift of humans to renew, whether it's a new week, a new day, a new year. And this was an opportunity for me to renew. Who did I want to be now that I was no longer a wife, no longer the mother of a two parent family, no longer the two income earning family. And I, this is my choice to rebuild my life. And I can do that in a way that's positive and productive and beautiful, or I can allow grief to become my identity and be miserable. Really a great message. I think we all have that opportunity and a lot of us don't see it. So no matter where you come from or what you've been through, we can renew, we can, we can create a new life and, and a new identity. And I think, you know, anybody who's gone through any kind of loss, you are changed. And instead of just being stuck, wishing that you were what you were, who are you now? I mean, even, even something as simple as I dated a guy, one of the first people I was in a relationship with after my divorce, he was not in good shape. Um, He was, he was, nice looking and slim, but he had no exercise routine at all. He ate terribly. These were things that really were against my value system. And when I would talk to him about it, he'd say, well, I used to be on the, the young, the oldest guy on the softball team. I used to be this, I used to do this. And I'm like, I don't really care what you used to do (laughs) (laughs) because I'm dating you now. And who you are now is a person who sits on his ass right? Right. and eats sweet candy. And ugh. anyway, um, but that's, that's, what's important. You know, I used to work out like a crazy person, but I don't do that now, but I do have an exercise routine because it's important to me to stay healthy. And so, you know, that re re-identification, who are you, who do you choose to be? What habits do you want to have? And Gratitude is such an important piece. Um, I just had somebody on who is going to, I don't know if her show is airing maybe right before yours, um, but her whole story was about meditation and gratitude and having it help you on your journey to love. And she had this really fun little um, sentence stem kind of thing to use. Like when you're complaining about something, and so I'll do it with you. What's something that you can share with me that you you've been complaining about lately? Well, oh goodness. So I try not to do this because I don't want to have a self-fulfilling prophe- prophecy, but I am on dating sites and complaining about the men that are there who are emotionally unavailable, but are there for other reasons. Okay. So let's say I get frustrated with the men I meet online who are emotionally unavailable. Um, And so what you would do is say, but I'm grateful because, and so you take that frustration and say, but I'm grateful because, so what would you add to that? But I'm grateful because there's a lot of people and I just need to meet the one. It doesn't matter about the, the many, it matters about the one. Yeah, it's true. And so it's like a simple little turnaround because it, it is frustrating. Online dating can be very frustrating. You meet a lot of people who are 
not right for you. Um, you know, you get excited about somebody who seems to be a good fit and then you start to learn more. It happened to me recently where this guy seemed really grounded in his profile. Like he seemed to align with many of my values. And then we're having a text conversation and he says, um, I just want to share with you a few things. I want a monogamous relationship. It's silly that we have to say this, right? And I'm like, you know, what's so weird about that? And then, it, then he hits me with, um, and I'm looking for a submissive woman um, who likes to be whipped or something. <laughs> I'm just like, oh gosh. okay, thank you for sharing. Not going to work for me. Good right. luck. But, you know, I'm also grateful that he let me know that before we went on our first date and then brought the whip or something. Yeah. But, and, and I'll tell you something, it's not, so to me, it's not about his kink and whatever he's into. It's the fact that he thinks that it's a good timing to tell someone that before they have even had a phone conversation and even know if we like each other. Because right. people can have, you know, all different sexual desires but if you don't even know someone, they, I'm not having that conversation. So that it was really the timing of it more than anything. Not that I would necessarily be into whips, but it's just, <laughs> I think we have to understand the next layer of what, what all this stuff so is. I've started this in my life, like there's just the saying, and I tell people all the time, first things first. And that's not first things. <laughs> and first things first are let's have a phone call and see if we like each other. And then the first things first becomes let's go on a date and see. And that shouldn't be entering into any of that until you get to that point. And I find too that with this online dating world, it's two, it's one of two extremes. Either people are emotionally avoidant and they have no intention of settling down with anyone or they want to be married after the first date. And it's, again, I just need to find the one that mirrors my values in that arena where we kind of settle into something at a, whatever a typical pace would be, but whatever that pace is that feels comfortable for us. Yeah. I mean, dating is really about revealing layers one after the other. It's not about dumping your whole life out. And here I am yeah. because we can't handle that. Like if you were to be on a first date and you start to talk about Paul's illness and then got into the details of the hospital and, you know, I don't know, like what cancer treatments were like, like, that's not something that people want to hear on a first date, I'm imagining. Yeah. Um, and it's, but a lot of people are still stuck there. And so they will share. And, you know, I, that client that one of the clients I was talking about before, who was really struggling with comparing every man she was dating with her husband who she lost, she would go on dates with, with widowers and then they would just get into a conversation about their loss. And so mm -hmm. what do you want people to know about that? I really, again, I went out with a guy who I really, really liked. And on our very first date, he told me that he was the adult child of an alcoholic and the survivor of child sexual abuse. And that's some heavy shit to lay on somebody <laughs> on the first date. And I really didn't know how to feel about that because then obviously you want to get into a conversation about the work that they've done because there's a lot of residual stuff that comes with that too, that can play out in your relationships. But to your point, that's the first date is not where you want to be getting into somebody's therapeutic background and how what type of work they did to recover from that so we don't necessarily need to know that but the same thing when I go out with people if they ask questions I will answer them openly and honestly and but I don't give too much information because some of it's very personal and private and I will share it with people once we are closer and I know that they're going to be around but some of it is not flattering to Paul's memory of things that he went through I feel like there's a respect issue for our relationship that we had a respect issue for my daughter and then a respect issue for what I'm building because I don't want to I just don't want it to be about Paul and me and what I went through with Paul I want it to be about what you and I are building together 
And the guy that I had dated that was emotionally unavailable that I said his wife left him for another woman, he talked about her constantly. And when I brought it up to him, he accused me of being jealous and threatened by her. And I was like, oh, good Lord. Like, no, I, I need you to not talk about her. This has nothing to do with being jealous or threatened. I just you know, talk about her a little bit, but I don't want every one of our conversations to revolve around her. And he introduced her into most of our conversations one way or another. And I was very aware of that and did not do that with Paul because I didn't want to put him in that same situation that he was putting me in. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, I teach a lot of redirecting conversation techniques to my clients because of things like this, like those two examples of dating somebody who keeps talking about an ex um, and sharing too much of your personal history. And it's, um, it's a lot to dump on somebody who you don't yet know. And even if you do know them well, to keep hearing about an ex feels like they're stuck and that they don't deserve to have a place in, in this relationships, in this relationship. And my son has a great line, which is, what does your therapist have to say about that? <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. I, I don't know where he heard it, but I, it's one of my favorite lines. It's like, instead of feeling like you have to shut the person down or fix them, right. redirect, right? <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. You're going to find out a lot by asking that question. Um, so Susan, um, for anybody out there who is dating a widow or widower, what would you like them to know? Oh, I would like them to know that. Wow. That's such a great question, Sandy, because there's, there's so many things spinning through my mind right now, <laughs> but I really want them to know that we believe in love. That's what I want people to know about me is I believe in love. I believe in being in a monogamous long-term relationship with somebody. I'm open to the idea of marriage again. I believe in second chances. And I also want people to know, don't mess with us. Like just, if you're not serious and if you've got a whole lot of issues, just walk away in the beginning. Cause we've already been through enough and we don't need to take on your baggage. And so just come to the table, serious and honest and open and vulnerable. And just know that we're, we believe in love. At least I believe in love. I think many, many people who have been widowed do believe in love. A lot of them are afraid of losing again. And um, I have a friend who married somebody much older than she is. Um, she was in her sixties and he was close to 80, but it was the most beautiful love relationship for both of them. And it was a big chance to take because she doesn't know how long he's gonna live, but their wedding was absolutely beautiful. He's sick also, he's got some form of cancer that's um it's terminal but it's it's slow and he's functional but she married him knowing all those things and they've been together for quite some time now i would say maybe seven eight years already and i and i think for a lot of people it's like you have to take chances love is about vulnerability it's about being open it's about taking risks and one of the risks we have is that it won't work out or somebody will pass away. Somebody will get sick. Things will change. And, you know, it's like they say, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And I think we all take those risks when we date, especially as we get older. And to me, there is nothing greater than a beautiful relationship. And Paul was 49 and he was healthy and thin and fit and never smoked a cigarette in a day, a day in his life and didn't drink and never did an illegal drug. <laughs> and at 49 years old died of lung cancer yeah. and there are no guarantees. So whether you're marrying somebody who's 30 or 40 or 80, you just don't know how much time you have with them. So just make the most of whatever time you do have. We can't live wondering if today's our last day or today's our spouse's last day. It, that doesn't even cross my mind, honestly. And 
I'm more worried about getting hurt by somebody who's not emotionally available than I am <laughs> about the person that I fall in love with passing away, which is interesting. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. Um, Susan, tell, tell our audience how they can find you and find your podcast, your fabulous podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, my podcast means so much to me. It's been an important part of my grief journey, and it can be found through any podcasting site, Tendrils of Grief. I have a website, www.tendrilsofgrief.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I have a Tendrils of Grief Facebook group and a Facebook business page that people are welcome to join. And I'd love to have you. It's again, just like your Facebook page, which is beautiful. I've not joined it and I'm going to, that's on my list of things to do this week. But I just, every time you talk about it, I'm like, oh, I want to get on that. But it's a positive space. It's not a space where we talk about woe is me. And if somebody does, it's people lifting them up. It's not people saying, yes, my life sucks too. And I, somebody said it beautifully. Like it's not the one upping people. That's a problem now. It's the one downing people. Like, you know, you're, you're bad, but let me tell you how I'm worse. And we don't do that. It's a lot of uplifting and it's a lot of, you're going to get through this. And I heard the most beautiful thing that I want to share with everybody is that when I talk to people, it's not that I'm invalidating your pain. I'm validating your ability to get through and beyond that pain on the other side. And that's the person I want to be for others. Mm, I love that. Well, you have such uh, incredible wisdom, values, vulnerability, the willingness to open yourself up again. And I, I enjoy every conversation I have with you, Susan. Thank you. So thank I you so it. much. Thank you. And I appreciate you so much. And I love what you do because I think for someone like me, who is coming after 20 years in a relationship into this new age of dating, I didn't even, I don't know who to be, what to do, what to say. And I think the service that you provide gives people a really good roadmap on how to navigate that, that confusing space. Grief is a confusing space, but dating is a very confusing space. <laughs> yeah, and there's a whole lot of grief in dating too. Yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Beth, for those kind words. I appreciate it. It is confusing. And one of the reasons I went into it is because I couldn't find the support I was looking for and, and just started curating all the knowledge out there. And I think we need to have a one-stop shop to really learn how to be a better human on our journey to lasting yes. love and how to navigate the space of modern dating because it is really confusing and it's so easy to lose yourself, to fall for people who are not who they say they are. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be savvy, but you also want to be open and vulnerable. Absolutely. And you know what, Sandy, it's really hard to not take it personally. And that's the one thing I've learned in my short time of doing the online dating is I don't know these people, their comments are not personal, they have to do with them. And I try to show up being kind to everyone, no matter what. That's... And I use the block feature a lot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Take the high road and you yeah. don't know them and they don't know you. So they can't right. reject you if they don't really know who you are. They're making up stories about who they are more than who you are. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go check out Susan's website and her podcast and all of her groups. And thank you everybody for listening today. If you love our show, please rate and review us. It always helps. If you go to Apple podcast, it's really easy on the mobile app and um, just look for last first date radio click leave a review and I will be your best friend. Thank you again. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. That's lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. I look forward to talking to you soon.